the fourth industrial revolution, technology transformation, uh, hasn't technology actually been influencing industries, uh, including the financial industry, for the past few decades already? So 1950s, we had the credit cards. Uh, the 60s, we had the ATMs. 70s was um, uh, electronic stock trading. 80s was um, e-commerce companies coming in and you know, um, disrupting everything, having online stock brokerage. Um, so basically, is this tech disruption really a new development? No, right? Then why is it that everyone is so fussed up about it? Why is everyone talking about it now? Um, I think the reason is that from here on, every next step we take, the impact is exponentially huge and it's exponentially faster. So that is the key reason why we have the entire audience still hanging around here till this late to hear your thoughts. Uh, and actually, try, like just um, without taking more time, let's get on and hear our panelists' views on what is the next big development, what is the next technology development that you guys are most excited about and that will change, completely revolutionize the way uh, businesses are operating right now. Uh, why don't we start with Dr. Sutapa? Well, thank you, Bloomberg, for inviting me to share the, the, the interview with such illuminaries. Um, I think the next step would definitely, and it actually has been in the last five to ten years, is AI. I think artificial intelligence will be part of everyday life. Imagine what happened about uh, more than a hundred years ago uh, when first electricity has become um, available. You just plug in the common device, put it in the electricity, and voila, it has become much more efficient, much faster. Um, now the field of AI has been in, you know, in development for the last 80 years, actually. But in the last 10 years or so, it has become commercializable. And that is the next phase of AI. Um, when I talk about AI, AI is like electricity. It will be part of life where today you can't imagine living without electricity. That will be part of it uh, in the next year. But the area that I would like to emphasize is um, right now we see a lot of shortages in the uh, uh, um, data scientists, data engineering, dev development, and um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the people are trying to re-educate or retool themselves. So I would like to, I would imagine that in the next decade or so, um, a lot of the AI can help, a lot of the AI program can help educating um, the new crops of, of talents. Um, the next one would be the shared infrastructure the shared data infrastructure that the government provide to uh, a lot of the a lot of the big corporates and small corporates, the small SME in the market. I see. So AI is the new electricity, guys. Uh, Sharon, moving on to you. I mean, given the strong foothold of Swift and payments, I mean, what is the next development that you're most excited about? Well, um, well, I guess in the in the space of. Uh, payments, and, and that's where we probably see a lot of the disruptions in this, in this space as well. Um, what we're seeing right now, the biggest trend is really um, on real time. We're seeing a lot of, in the domestic front, you see a lot of the um, domestic real-time payment systems. In, in a lot of countries, they are actually embarking uh, in implementing real-time payment systems. So you have Thailand, you have PromPay here. Singapore, we have uh, Fast or PayNow. Um, Hong Kong, you have the Hong Kong FPS, and Malaysia is also embarking on their real-time payment systems. But Actually, so let me put you on the spot there. <laughs> like, among these four markets, which one do you think is the most developed in terms of the infrastructure for real-time payments? Well, they are all there right now. So mm -hmm. Malaysia, is, is, um, Malaysia and Hong Kong is, is in, a, in the process of uh, uh, setting up their, their real-time payment systems, right? So uh, we're supporting them in, in, in some way or another. Um, but real time is definitely one um, area that we see that is really going to make payments faster, obviously, in the domestic front. But also, the countries are also looking at how we can make cross border real time as well. How can we speed up um, real time uh, retail payments cross border uh, in, in a real time basis? So, so, one of the this is more, I guess, on the cross-border side, this is really close to our heart from a SWIFT perspective, right? Because we, we do a lot of uh, cross-border payments. And that's why in January 2017, we came up with a new um, initiative called GPI, which is a SWIFT Global Payment Innovation. Um, this really helps to... Uh, there's really three key things in, in SWIFT GPI is to make payment faster, providing transparency, 
and also importantly to provide uh, traceability. So allowing the banks, their customers to be able to track where the payment is. So this is really exciting and all using new technology like cloud and APIs yeah. as well. It's pretty much like a DHL for your payments, <laughs> <Yes>. essentially. <laughs> okay, Klaus, so you have actually been helping a lot of industries disrupt themselves. So what are you most excited about? A lot of things, but amongst others, augmented humanity is a big thing for us right now. So what we try to work at at SAP is basically take all the great technologies we have available and bring it together. So basically the convergence, the integration of technology that we have, or for that matter, some of the many great partners we have, and bring that into one intelligent enterprise platform. What that gives you ultimately is an opportunity where we today can provide systems, ERP solutions, where you can talk to your ERP solutions, your financial systems. It can give you a real-time response. It can give you insights on things that you may not have asked for, but based on your questions, it will give you an indication of things that others would have liked to have known that they were, where they've asked the same question. So basically moving into the space, robotics, artificial intelligence go under the same umbrella, but it all comes down to bringing all the technology we have available today into one integrated intelligent enterprise platform. Awesome. That's the Leonardo platform as well, right? Amongst others. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think from my viewpoint, um, mobile phones will become redundant sooner than any of us expect. Yeah, look at me with a little bit of surprise, because given the pace at which voice recognition, facial recognition is, taking, uh, is developing, and, you know, wearable devices, human microchip implants, UOB is actually doing work around this, and actually the very mobile phones that you guys are so glued into you might find them redundant very soon. So I think just kind of focusing a little bit more on the AI aspect, especially Klaus, Dr. Sutapa, since you guys have been working on that front. I mean, how do you perceive some of the ethical concerns that kind of accompany the AI uh, bandwagon, right? Um, especially like around job losses. So what are your thoughts around it? Maybe uh, Dr. Sutapa, if you could to share. Start, um, I would like to sort of take that in perspective a little bit. Um, in 1400, I'm sorry, we talk about 4.1, 4.0, but let's go back to 1400. 60% of population in the UK are needed, uh, were needed to feed the entire country, right? And uh, today it's 1%. So uh, if we actually come up and put a lot of resource in the, um, in the protectionism uh, regulation, that would not have happened. The technology innovation would not have happened. Uh, and I would like to point out that a lot of these uh, regulations, such as minimum wage, can actually uh, be a short-term solution and um, accelerate the adoption of automation. So um, in some way, I would hope that the energy, the investment going into uh, subsidized uh, educational retouring of the displaced worker, uh, better social safety net, and you know, using technology is actually uh, increasing job opportunity for the people who got displaced by the development for automation because you can't, you yeah, can't really slow that down. That's a very fair economic theory, right? Like right. those investments go into other areas. What are your thoughts, Klaus? Like, I think AI offers a fantastic opportunity uh, to all nations, all companies, all government institutions around the world. The reason being, it gives an opportunity to automate processes irrespective of what kind of field you're in. There's a lot of manual work done, and with what technology do today provides a platform where you can automate that. Yes, you can take the more negative perspective that will provide job loss. Uh, I tend to take the more optimistic view of it. It offers an opportunity to give the workforce the chance to work on more value-added work. Instead of sort of crunching in, in your financial spreadsheets number, why wouldn't that be more automated? You spend your time analyzing the numbers that is provided to you and take the right action to guide your business in the right direction or make the right decision if you're sitting in a government agency or institution. Yep, absolutely. So guys, here is the opportunity. Uh, if you think you've got like a relatively dull job, crunching numbers on Excel, and I hope you attended the <laughs> session with Gagan today, AI is our opportunity to follow our dreams, you know, follow the dream job. So uh, that's a very interesting uh, viewpoint, actually. Um, let's move on to the next session, uh, which pertains to the relationship between the financials industry, as we have known it so far, and the big tech. Uh, I'd like to poll the audience on that front. Basically, the banks are trying to uh, enter into the uh, space of e-commerce, provide marketplaces, whereas uh, the big tech 
uh, or the e-commerce companies are trying to provide financial services, wealth products. So they're all entering into each other's arena, uh, which was actually dominated by the other. So uh, the question is, uh, who will win? Will it be the Wall Street? Or will it be the Silicon Valley? Uh, please take out your phones. This is a tech session, so that's what we got to use. And um, tell me, what do you think? Who will win? Uh, will it be the tech giants like Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent? Or will it be the core financials industry that we've kind of seen uh, in its uh, shape and form so far? Um, and while the audience uh, polls on it, I want to pose the same question to my panelists. Uh, and not just who will win, but also what is the key advantage that one has versus the others which will help them fight and defend themselves in this war? So I'm going to start with Dr. Sutapa again. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I definitely uh, have a vested interest in answering one question or the other. But I, let me put this this way. We don't just see... Uh, we will see and we have been seeing lots of partnership you know, between just not just tech company, but also very different industry that actually technology has helped uh, enable that partnership. Uh, we can see fashion industry and technology. We can see, uh, you know, remember Pokemon Go as retailer and gaming industry. Uh, we can see, you know, uh, we just launched... Um, you know, the, uh, the uh, online lending platform with Lazada, so it's e-commerce and, and SCB, uh, which is a bank. And um, we will see many, many other, because not so much about technology, but because of the data that's become much more available. So the technology in which we can draw information and the regulations that surrounding that ability to connect the data is very important. And when, uh, now that I talked about regulations, I just want to add one sentence, is uh, privacy, and um, the, the privacy and the abuse issue have to be discussed very closely along with the technology. So I just want to put that in perspective. Sure. I mean, obviously, there is no lone battle, like your partners or your allies kind of decides who wins the war. But if I were to put you in a spot and ask you, like, what is the core advantage that, say, a bank like Siam Commercial brings to the table that the big tech may not have just as yet? Like, what helps them fight that war? I, I think the most important word is just yet, right? So uh, right now, we certainly have a much more localized knowledge of the customers. But that's the word, just yet. So... Um, this is, uh, we see more and more partnership between tech company and traditional uh, industry part, uh, players, but uh, the time would go on when the traditional business would have to look into what would be the, the real knowledge beyond just you know, being, uh, understanding the customers. They have to have the real technology development within themselves. So you see a lot of technology, um, uh, sorry, we see a lot of, of uh, traditional players uh, investing more and more into their own technology. I see. And Klaus, like, what do you think the big tech has yeah. an edge on? Yeah. I'm a little bit torn here. I actually started my career in the financial sector in the Copenhagen Stock Exchange. Uh, I turn to the tech sector, so I, I guess I have to uh, vote for the tech sector to win this battle. <laughs> I, I guess uh, the, the, the more uh, uh, important part of your question uh, is obviously uh, who has an advantage. I, I think what we are observing across the nearly 400,000 customers we have acro uh, across the world is that the one who really wins the battle in the, in the battlefield are the one who knows most about their customers. The one who have the ability to predict what their customer wants. The one who have the ability to predict it in real time. The one who have the ability to create products, solutions, services, and provide them to their customers when they need them, where they need them, at the right price point. So there are many great tech players out there who's doing this already today. But I think the fantastic part of this is there's a lot of bank, a lot of financial institution who's moving rapidly in that direction. Example being, uh, three of the largest banks we have in Indonesia is embarking on a journey or have already on a journey where they're on a mobile platform uh, provided by SAP, basically giving their customer the experience that they can do all their banking service online, as well as for the bank to get more insights what their customer wants. So I guess, end of the day, we, uh, future will tell who will win, but I think whoever has listened most to the customer and act upon is probably the one who signed on stage last. That makes complete sense, right? So basically, banks are becoming big techs now in that way. Uh, Sharon, what is your thoughts around it? I mean, I'm sure all the tech companies are kind of vying for that 
cream business that you have on the payment side. So what does SWIFT have to defend turf and to kind of go in and protect its own territory? Well, um, as you know, like SWIFT is a, is a member-owned cooperative, right? So we, we're pretty much owned by the bank, so I think I have my shareholders here uh, t today. Uh, but we, what we see is like, you know, the banks, our shareholders are really stepping up the game right now. And um, we, there's a lot of uh, very innovative collaboration that's going on as well. So SWIFT obviously play a very uh, key role in when it comes to around innovations, right? So earlier on, I talked about the SWIFT GPI. It is a collaboration between, uh, it's a collaboration between SWIFT and, and the banks, helping the banks to facilitate that. That's one. Now, the other thing is like, I think I was asking a, a client today, I said, when was the first time you heard about fintech startup? And he says, well, two, three years ago. I said, yeah, that's, that's what I've, I've heard as well. The, the, the reason being, the reason why I ask is because SWIFT actually has an arm called SWIFT InnoTribe. We set up InnoTribe since 2009. So it's been for almost 10 years right now. So InnoTribe was actually set up uh, with the objective to facilitate innovation, collaboration between fintechs and the banks. So we, we, does it, we did it through a global industry challenge. So every year there is a global industry challenge that is held um, by SWIFT, facilitated, facilitated by InnoTribe, bring banks and fintech together really to solve the problems that the banks are experiencing. So, so it has been ongoing. So last year, we, we did that in uh, Singapore, uh, and we brought uh, five global fintechs into Singapore with 30 banks participating in this, uh, in this session, two days of workshop, and we got two winners. Um, and these two winners right now is, is a fintech company from UK and one from Australia. And right now, we are actually creating overlay, working with them, creating overlay services uh, on top the the Swift Rails, working, collaborating with the banks. So, so we've been yeah, doing that. So you just go disrupt yourself. I mean, this is not a lone <laughs> battle to fight. I would very much like to see what the audience has polled for, like who is going to win the battle. Can we please see the poll results? Ooh. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Klaus, I think you were bang on. At least I still have a career. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see how ASEAN uh, shows this kind of a battle win over. I mean, if you were to look at China's example, the winner is very clear. But regulatory aspects and those developments kind of play a huge role in terms of how much disruption big tech can uh, do. And the other thing is the banks pretty much are becoming tech companies. If you follow what DBS says, um, he is literally a tech company. That's what he claims. Um, I think we'll quickly move on to the next uh, final uh, session of uh, uh, areas that we want to kind of uh, address. And I would really like the audience to poll on this again. Um, the question is, in this new world order, which is, what is the issue that actually keeps you awake at night? What is your key concern for you or for your clients or for your company? Um, could you please, yeah. Uh, we'll take the results in about next one or two minutes. And uh, while the audience polls, I'd very much like to kind of uh, get a quick uh, answer from you guys. Like, what is your key concern in this new world order? Dr. Sudhava. Uh, hmm. I, when I first glanced through all the three choices, I would uh, jump immediately to the third one, which is you know, the shortage of HR, how to recruit good talent, particularly in data scientists. But this is how fleeting this um, calamity will be for the company. At the end of last year, I read an article on LinkedIn that says, data scientist is the sexiest job in the world right now. And then just last week, I read an article also from LinkedIn saying that data science dead in five years or less. You know, so, uh, so for, for that is, you know, this is very short-lived uh, problem. And, and uh, for me, the reason for that is um, right now, People are really have a high hope, high, you know, what, what's the real challenge for me is, is managing the hypes and the hopes and the myth of artificial intelligence and data scientists itself. And, that, and therefore, managing that to the partners, managing that to the board holder, managing that to the shareholders. So um, all of these are extremely crucial and uh, HR is important, but understanding the practical what they can deliver, what are they, what it is for, is much more important. That's a very fair point, right? Data science is actually a science, it's not God. So, I mean, keep your expectations accordingly, right? Um, Sharon, what is your key uh, 
what is the key challenge or what's the key issue that you think? Yeah, well, I, I think, um, I guess cyber, the reason why I picked cybersecurity will be um, because it is actually one of the areas that we focus a lot in SWIFT and with our industry. So as the industry innovates, digitize, um, that is an area, cybersecurity has to be embedded in everything that you do, right? Um, so we, there are, it, the, the cybersecurity is actually in the DNA of, of SWIFT because yeah. we, we are actually managing uh, a very critical uh, messaging infrastructure um, that every two to three days the world, the value of the world GDP goes across our network and we're supporting basically 11,000 um, market infrastructures financial institutions and corporates. So it is, it is very key to us. And now it makes sense for us to have a natural extension and, and providing that support to our, to our industry yeah. as well. I mean, um, the $6 million hack that happened by one of the Russian lenders, I'm sure, I mean, the network by itself was <laughs> secure, but how do you deal the end point, how do you deal with the endpoints yeah. and the vulnerabilities for your clients? So, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've been operating this for over 40 years and, and there's definitely no breach or no compromise on our network. The, the, the incidents that we've seen so far is really at the endpoints itself and, and that's why we came up with the customer security program, really looking at three, three areas. Is to is about you, the bank. How do you protect and secure your local environment? Your counterparts. How do you prevent and detect any fraud? And lastly, is really about the community, right? So how do you prevent future attacks through sharing of information? Absolutely. I yeah. think I'll have to agree with that as well. I mean, Cisco shared the number of attacks that they prevent every day is higher than the number of. Google searches that happen in a day. I mean, you can well imagine how vulnerable we are uh, to a cyber security, uh, to a cyber attack, right? Um, Klaus, what would you pick? So 77% um, of the world's transactions run on SAP platform. So my biggest worry is that SAP systems cannot go down because otherwise the world will go down. I think combined with the fact that uh, we obviously want to service our customers in a way that they can continue to disrupt their business model, using technologies. So out of the options you provided, uh, disruption with technology is one of the areas that uh, stay very much in our focus and manage it in such a way that it becomes an, an opportunity and not a threat. I guess you had another one that was on the list regarding talent capability. And just to add to it, the technology is there today. It's not a lack of technology. There's plenty of great uh, technologies out there that you can uh, buy and, uh, uh, in an affordable manner. May that be uh, SAP or some of the great solutions we are working with. I think the part that is obviously creating the magic is if you have the technology and you add the right skill set. And in the region we are in right now, uh, we obviously need to continue to foster the right IT skills capabilities. There's some great initiative that SAP has done in Africa where we actually have trained half a million young students on coding, a simple skill, but a very useful skill as you emerge yourself into your future career. Similar thing we have done here in ASEAN with the ASEAN Data Science Explorer competition. 5,000 students just equipped with some data and a, a basic data analytics skills. Data science may be not be that hot, but still there's a lot of students who would like to get into the competition. Actually, so I think the Singapore companies that were polled during the expo last year, this, was, this came up as one of the key issues that they have been facing. Not just data scientists and data engineers, but even management within technology has been one of the key areas uh, that companies are kind of challenged with. And they're trying to, I think immigration laws play, play a huge role in that. And I mean, we, we're kind of hearing some new immigration rules that might come up in Thailand. So that's another area to watch out for. Um, I'd very much like to see what the audience thinks is the main challenge and what is keeping them awake at night. Could we please see the results on that? Here you go, Klaus, again. I think he has the best feel for like, what the real businesses are kind of struggling with. So um, to that point, I think in terms of business disruption, it will be very interesting to kind of um, look at how Charles Schwab took this as an opportunity, you know, like the, the key idea is to disrupt yourself before your competition comes and disrupts you, right? Um, what are your thoughts around that? Like, how are you helping the companies to disrupt themselves? So what we do with uh, most of our companies around the world, and that's approaching more, more or less 400,000 right now, is helping to imagine how the future would look like for them. Try to uh, get them out of their comfort, comfort zone, zone 
and given the, the, the art of the possible. What we try to work with now, not only define best practices, we have been here for four decades plus. We operate across 25 industries. We know very well what are the best practices. But our obligation as SAP, given who we are and our history, is actually to define the next practices. So that's what we spend most of our time with our customer around, try to, to give them a perspective of what could the next practice looking around enable with this intelligent enterprise that we can offer to our customers now.